Did you listen in at all last week? I did for about 15 minutes. I happened to be on a lunch break. Nice. Yeah, it was a weird time doing it at, you know, 2 p.m. on a Friday. <laughs> it just worked but for I my schedule, to, so I did it. I went back and listened to some of the replay, too. Oh, yeah. It was funny. I asked early on if anyone had listened or watched the uh, implicit racial bias stuff mm -hmm. and kind of got crickets at first. And then someone came back in later because I can't really see who's coming and going. But someone jumped in and was like, I just watched the video and then started commenting on it. So while I was live, yeah, they went and watched the video. All right, we're live. Hey, guys, if there's anyone out there watching already, um, it says one viewer, but I can't tell. I don't know if that's you or somebody else. I'm here with a gentleman by the name of Kristen Ware. He is in the academy right now, and um, we're just sitting down to record a podcast episode about this and I said let's let's live stream this so that people can jump in and ask questions if they have any about what the process is like going to the academy what to expect that kind of stuff so here we are we're live if no one is um, jumps in here that's fine this is for the podcast and uh, for you guys if you're if you want to have be part of the conversation you can be um, Kristen's with Wilmington North Carolina Police Department about 270 officers the academy is run by the community college and is not only for Wilmington PD. Um, multiple agencies all together in one place. He comes from a background in education, 11 years. What, what, uh, did you, were you one grade level? I what taught did you high school teach? and I did high school band and music. Okay. Um, and I'll leave it at that. Explain real quick why you wanted to, why you decided to become an officer um, versus staying with education. It's kind of a joke that I tell my wife and, and several friends that, you know, I, I sit in a classroom all day waiting for somebody to come into my classroom and shoot, shoot it up because that's happened a lot in the recent past. Mm -hmm. But I said, you know, now at least I have a gun on myself to be able to defend myself and others because the first day of class, I would always come in and say, okay, no, I'm Mr. Ware. This is for real. There's two doors in the classroom. If a shooter comes in that door, you run out that door. I run toward him. If the shooter comes in that door, you run out that door and I run toward him. And they're like, you run toward him. I said, yes, I'm here to protect you, whether or not I have a gun. And so that kind of was a sobering thought, you know, thinking, hey, at least I'll be able to be trained and defend myself and others this time. Okay. So... That's an interesting concept, and I, it is something that really um, – I, I didn't think we would really go here, but since you brought it up, that that is something that bothers me a lot with kids that are getting to that point where you know, they're going to get into public schools and, and not – and knowing that they're not protected. Um, that's a big issue we have in this country. We're kind of in the middle where it, you, we've got a country full of guns, but we're – we're also trying to legislate against that, and we're doing so in some pretty um, non-intelligent ways by creating safe zones where people that want to harm people, you know, can do so at will. So, um, yeah, that I understand that how that could be really disconcerting for you because legally, I assume um, in North Carolina, just like anywhere else, you cannot have a gun as what even as a teacher, right? This was in Tennessee that I was teaching. That was in Tennessee. Yeah. And they did actually pass the legislation to where teachers could carry, but it had to be approved by the Board of Education and then training and all that. And none of that happened in my district. So oh, okay. kind of out, out of luck there. That's better than it is here. At least they give you the option. Um, here, it's not even an option. It's just, no, you can't have a gun in a school unless you're a uniformed officer. Right. Um, by the way, I'm wearing my my sweater from the academy that we worked out in nice. um, just for kicks and giggles, but I'm going to take it off because I'm really hot. <laughs> um, before, while I do that, answer this. In it, the, probably one of your first emails that you sent me, you asked, what should I expect from the academy? You know, you, you sent me an email and said, I'm a teacher. I'm going into law enforcement. I'm about to go to the academy. What can I expect? Give me a heads up here. Uh, try to give me an edge. Um, and so 
I'm going to kick that back to you. What did you expect? Uh, we'll start with that. What did you expect going into it? Well, I'll tell you this. The first um, week I got there, there was a lot of people that were teachers, you know, of the academy and, you know, people that are in administration in charge of the academy telling me, oh, you'll be fine. You have, I have a master's degree. So they were like, oh, you'll be fine. You're, you're well educated. You won't have a problem getting through this, you know? And I was like, okay. And so I didn't, I expected it to be, I guess, not easy, but doable um, because they told us that the curriculum is based on what an 18 year old would be able to do right out of high school. And so it's kind of a, Basic. I mean, the name of it is basic law enforcement training. So it's right. fairly basic on, on the level. And I go into things, you know, whenever you're getting a master's degree, you're planning on writing papers that are long and drawn out. And I had a lot of trouble with, you know, report writing because I'm trying to be too extravagant. And they're telling me, keep it simple, just the facts, just a sentence here and there, you know. So I had a lot of trouble with that and understanding how to it sounds bad when I say it, but how to dumb it down because I really, I was trying to be too, uh, over the top with it. No, it, for me, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, I've gone both ways now when I, when I was in the Academy, I had the same problem. Um, you, there's no commas and complex sentences. It's, right. it's very broken and it, it's very low level reading. Um, very simple. It is not eloquent at all. No. It sounds terrible. Yeah. Um, if you're if you're reading it to your kid like like a story, they would lose attention in about two sentences, right? Like right. it's just it's really dry. It's just the facts, and yeah, I had the same experience. And now leaving law enforcement and actually writing again as a writer, I have had. It was really difficult at first. I'm still trying to overcome that that long period of my life where I was forced to write like an idiot, um, <laughs> to be honest. And so I'm I'm kind of like it kind of stunted my writing ability. You know, yeah. I, I've I've been I'm, I'm still struggling with that. I don't. I mean, at least that's my excuse. And I said something. We were doing an interview class, and I said. Uh, tell me the events that transpired this afternoon. And they said, hold up, tell them to say, tell me what happened <laughs> because <laughs> yeah. like, don't use big words. Just don't do it. And I was like, okay, I'm Trans getting that in my mind. Transpired is much never too said large. Random words like that. And I was like, well, okay. Cause I mean, I'm coming from the classroom using words like that for my kids saying, Hey, if you talk with a big vocabulary, people will be impressed. And now I have yeah. to low, low level, dumb it down. All right. Sorry, I lost my notes here. Um, so it, anything else that has stood out to you aside from um, the writing stuff? Yeah, I, just the experience of, I guess, making the transition from, from civilian to police officer. I, I'm seeing things in a little bit of a different light, and I, I didn't realize it. Like when you see a police officer on the street, you don't realize the, the techniques and, and what they're doing every second of the, of the time that they're talking to you and paying attention and writing things down in a notebook and interviewing you and how their, their stance and where their hands are and stuff like that. You just don't think about it until you are training to do it. You know, right. body position is everything, making sure that you always have the advantage, making sure that you're, you know, your weapon is in a certain position, making sure that your, your body's in a certain position. You just right. don't think about things like that when you're going, you know, when you're just talking to a regular police officer, you, you know, until you're actually going through the training for it. And so the perception of that was a little bit different. Um, making the transition in my mind to it's, it's a mental transition of I'm going from normal everyday citizen without a care in the world. You know, even though I had a concealed carry permit and I carried and I was a little bit more vigilant than normal citizen, uh, you're, you're hyper vigilant whenever you're, in the uniform because that uniform itself makes you a target. So you have to really understand that maybe not everybody's out to get you, but everybody could be out to get you. So you have to be aware of your surroundings a whole lot more. Right. Um, I'm understanding this more. Yeah. A lot of good points there. I think people, civilians oftentimes have no idea what, what an officer is doing, even though they're standing there, 
talking to them right then, right? Like they don't know why or don't even notice that you're, you're blading a certain way or uh, the things that you're listening to or the questions that you're asking. And, and this is where I think there's a lot of misunderstanding um, and, and a lot of frustration on the civilian side is like officers do tend to ask pointed questions for a reason. Um, and civilians feel like, well, you're trying to catch me doing something. You're trying to get me in trouble. And that is, that's just what cops do. I mean, their job is to investigate, to just to peel back the onion. Everyone, everyone has things going on. Um, and, and some guys don't turn that off well in, in casual, um, civilian conversations. Uh, and that makes officers sometimes unrelatable. Mm -hmm. Um, and then your, your comment about being hyper vigilant. I think that is something that would concern a lot of civilians right now because of the national conversation. Um, I think there's an impression that's been created out there that police are just trained to not trust anyone. And the impression is that the, that police overreact and take things way too far, uh, way too fast sometimes, instead of trying to the, the word that people often use is de-escalate. So can you speak to that as far as how, what your experience is there? Because you are coming from the civilian world, um, although you already were much more vigilant than a typical civilian. Um, how have they taught you to be vigilant? Uh, but and, and how well have they balanced that with? You also have to make sure uh, you are identifying threats accurately before you, you know, react or overreact. Well, a couple of points. Uh, we had, we had some vice guys come in to do, um, confidential informant interviews. We were, we were interviewing them and getting information from them as an acting CI, you know, it's kind of like a scenario that was set up. And, uh, whenever the, at the end, when we were done, we had done our interviews, they came into the classroom and started talking to us and they said, uh, one of the guys said something that was like, we all just sat there and went, huh? He said, uh, I like all of you and I think that you're going to do well. But when I came into this classroom today, I had a plan to kill everybody and yeah. walk out of the room. And I was like, what? Like, it, it yeah. just shocked me when he said that. And I know he didn't mean like, hey, I'm going to kill everybody. But it's, I have an escape route. I have a plan. And it's just a mindset that you have to develop of if things go south, I'm going to get out of here alive and go home. And I, I get that, you know, like it, it made sense after he said it. He was just one of the nicest guys that I've ever talked to. But when he said that, it was like really shocking and surprising that people don't normally hear that kind of thing coming from a regular person's mouth. So, you know, that that was a little bit of a shock. Right. But even, even things like that, you know, just they're telling us to make sure that, you know, we are we have a hobby. I've, I've been told that about 15,000 times. Make sure you have a hobby. Make sure you have an outlet, something that you can release this tension from your day because you're grabbing all the baggage that you go through with, you know, this person's been shot, this person got killed, this person got raped, this person, whatever. The things that you deal with on a regular basis, all the calls, the accidents that you see, somebody's injured and may not make it through the night, you know, and then you come home to your family and everything's normal. And it's like, you still have all that in your head, in your eyes. Um, so, yeah, it, it's like, you watch any of these war movies, um, recent one, American Sniper, mm -hmm. uh, Chris Kyle story, you know, these guys go to war and they're in, and they are in war and they come back and they've just been in a completely different world where everyone's trying to kill you and they've done and seen these crazy, terrible things that they never thought, at least even still don't think should ever happen. And life back here is just easy peasy. Um, everyone acts like there's nothing going on, not paying attention to what's going on overseas, whatever. And I think law enforcement officers experience much the same thing because they know what's going on behind those doors. Um, I remember when I got my job with my police department, I lived outside the city and then about, uh, was it? couple a year two in I think it was about a year in we moved into the city so we're looking for a place to live and 
and actually we had looked beforehand and you drive through these neighborhoods and it's like, oh, this would be a good neighborhood. This would be a good neighborhood. And then you work there for a year or two and you, it's like, nope, I'm not living there. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there. There aren't any neighborhoods left because even the nice neighborhoods, there's crazy stuff going on and the outside might look nice and pretty. Um, there are some things you can look at a house and go, okay, they, th what's going on behind closed doors would surprise people. But you walk inside these houses and it's like, there's no carpet. It, they're torn up holes in the walls you know th they're trashed or whatever like there's there's a world that civilians don't know about unless they're the ones the police are dealing with all the time most right. civilians have no idea uh what is going on around them on a, on a daily basis or what's going on in their neighborhood um you know all the time so it's very eye-opening and i have to say this too good um, in my firearms class today, we talked about uh, statistics of uh, officer-involved shootings, mm -hmm. and the instructor says to us, uh, about 20% 20, 20 of you in this class will probably be involved, you know, statistically in an officer-involved shooting. And then he said, wait a second, I probably should say 40% given the, what's going on now. And he's like, yeah. you know, up the percentage because of all the, the shootings that have been happening. So, you know, whether it be an officer shooting or you know, somebody shooting at an officer, an officer involved shooting of some type. So it's, it's real It's reality. It's like what you're saying. It's kind of like a war zone here. And that PTSD is really a real thing now, even more so than it was before. Right. Yeah. And it'll be, it's scary to think how the environment right now in the media and just in this country uh, with the police, hold on my phone. My phone's trying to talk to me for some reason. Um, how that's going to affect not only it goes both ways. You look at like the message of Black Lives Matter. How does that cause young black men to react to law enforcement presence? And that has a huge impact on the outcome of that event. But also, how is it going to just this environment in general going to impact training and the mindset of officers is are, are we going to move toward a under siege this is a war and we need to bunker down um type training i think this depends on each individual academy um or is it no we need to humanize our officers and reach out and focus even more and push harder with community policing that kind of stuff so it'll be interesting to see how that goes, but right. um, do you feel like they've done, how, how much percentage-wise do you think they've focused on on the be vigilant and stay alive versus your job is to serve and protect and be part of the community? Well, I can speak to that in two different ways because the community college part of it, the instructors and everything have really gone to training everybody in terms of practical application on the street and saying, this is what you'll be dealing with. I know it says this in the book, but this is what's really going to happen. And so they kind of, you know, they do a really good job of giving us a real life picture of it. But in terms of the community policing, when I got hired, especially at Wilmington, um, that was the big question. I interviewed with the assistant chief before that was like the last interview before my polygraph. And he was, really insistent on from from the agency what is community policing what's your definition of it how does it apply to you how does it apply to this agency how do you put it into practice and i i had heard the term before but i wasn't really prepared to answer that question yeah and so i just kind of guessed and apparently i guessed right and i was like um going into the community talking to people and making those connections before you arrest them because, you know, like kind of give, getting a relationship with the people on your beat. So, you know, you know, these are the people that I'm dealing with every day. So that right. whenever you go to arrest them or arrest a friend of theirs, they're not going to provide any interference or anything like that. You know, they'll, they'll understand you're just doing your job. Right. And so it kind of, you know, we've had many, many conversations about community policing. But that that's a huge deal with the Wilmington Police Department. That's good to hear. Um we have a few people watching and commenting. Someone told you to, I, I assume this is directed at you because I'm not in the academy. They said 25 burpees. So uh, <laughs> anytime, anytime during the interview, you want to hit those up. 
I'll have you know um, that I did 155 push-ups tonight. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's pretty good. Um, all right, so there's a question in here. Um, so up here in Connecticut, all town police go through a state police run academy, same as the state PD state patrol goes through. Um, and this is from Caitlin. She's asking, so do all, all right, I want to make sure I have this question, right? So all Connecticut PDs go through the same training. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. So I, I, I don't know. I thought it was a question, but I'm not seeing it. I, if you're asking anything, Caitlin, I assume you're asking, is that the same everywhere else you go? Um, and the answer is no. It, for I can speak for Nebraska and I'll let Quist, Kristen speak for um, North Carolina, Carolina, but Nebraska, you basically have three large academies that do their own, and that is the state patrol. They do their own academy at the like state academy. Uh, which is in Grand Island. Then you have Lincoln Police and Omaha Police. They do their own academies. They're the two largest in the state. And then everyone else in the state goes to the same place as State Patrol. It's at that academy facility, but it's a separate academy. Um, I've heard the horror stories from other other academy classes who were there at the same time State Patrol was and how um, militarized the state patrol academy is versus ours which was not at all but that's how it works in nebraska Kristen, um obviously you are at the community college with your you said 14 of your officers there's and then, 24 and then a bunch of other agencies yeah. 24 total in the class 14 of them from wpd okay uh, the rest are from either not hired or from other agencies okay so how many agencies potentially could your academy service a lot um, cause it, where I'm located is right at the beach. So you have the city of Wilmington right across the bridge is Wrightsville beach. And then you have like Carolina beach, Curry beach, and there's several other, uh, beach departments. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, um, the county sheriff, and then you've got, uh, the North Carolina highway patrol. And of course the SBI and all that kind of stuff. But you know, there's it's pretty, pretty much the same, what you're talking about. The, the highway patrol has their own Academy in Raleigh. And it's like a on-site barracks military type style thing where it's like 32 weeks or something. It's something mm -hmm. insane. Right. And I actually looked into that before I did WPD and I was like, yeah, I don't really want to be away from home that long. Whose was so, that? Uh, the highway patrol. Yeah. And there, I mean, you only get to go on the weekends on home and it's two and a half hours from here. So I didn't want to deal with that. Yep. Um, yeah. So uh, that was something I wanted to ask you. Do you, do you have to stay at the academy during the week or do you, you can go home? No, it's, it's just the college is like two miles down the road from my house. Okay. So we That's even awesome. lunch and everything. So awesome. That's our academy. We could go home. No, actually, I don't know if you could to take, I take that back. I'm not sure you could go home. It was like an hour and 45 minutes away. Um, so we couldn't anyways, we went home on the weekends, but, um, I'm not sure you could, they, you, I think you had to stay on campus during the week, but the same was true for our, our state patrol. They're stuck there. And I think you actually have to stay there even on weekends. Initially, if I, if the rumors are correct, i would have to verify that was a trooper, but, um, it's interesting how the state patrols tend to be much more militarist, militaristic, um, I'm not sure exactly where that trend comes from. They they are definitely um, they have a different mentality, a different purpose. But I, it's interesting. I'd like to find out if that is true for all state patrols, or which ones have moved on from that to more, you know, um, I don't want to say modern, but away from that militaristic style. Uh, I have um, a little bit of a different situation too, because the Wilmington PD people. Um, we're hired by the city of Wilmington already to go through the academy. And so they're paying us, you know, salary and benefits. So we pretty much have to work a 40 hour work week for them. So if we have like 30 hours of class time at Cape Fear Community College, then we have to make up that other 10 hours at the station doing something. So we'll be, you know, going to the station two or three hours a day to make something up. 
sometimes they'll give us 10 code tests. They'll, you know, make sure that our uniform's inspected. And we'll go out to the, uh, to the gym at the station and work out as a group, that kind of thing. So whatever it takes to get our 40 hours a weekend is what we do. Hmm. Okay. So we have dual obligations. Okay. For the record, it's not Caitlin. It's Pat. Pat's on Caitlin's YouTube account. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, we got a question and I have an outline here, but uh, I'll address questions as they come in. Marcus asks, does the police department screen new candidates on who may be a possible racist? Or who may be ra who may be possible racists? Um, your comments on that, Kristen? You just went through the hiring Absolutely. process. Absolutely, um, they they ask so many questions. I never thought the hiring process was going to be this involved, but I mean, they ask questions upon questions. I even had them ask me during my interview before the polygraph seven questions in a row that were exactly the same question, just to see if I would answer it the same way every time. And I was like, I even giggled at one point. I was like, you just asked me that. Oh, wait, never mind. I'll just answer it. And I was like, right. you're doing this for a reason. But yeah, I mean, they, anything from, I mean, just random off the wall stuff. Like, have you ever looked at child porn? Have you ever sold drugs? Have you, I mean, you know, like just things you wouldn't even think about as a normal person, but they ask you everything. Yep. So, yes. They screen very well. That, that falls right in line with my experience. Um, I felt violated by the time I got through all of the questions, the psychological exam, and especially the polygraph. That was the most awkward experience of my life. I really have nothing to hide, um, but I'm also very just self-conscious about, uh, in, I guess, integrity is what it comes down to, just all, telling the truth no matter how small it is. So they asked me a question. This was the only one that came up as, as iffy. They have like, you might remember the terms. It's been a while for me, but they can basically say, yes, it's clear that you're hiding something or lying. It's indeterminate, you know, it's somewhere in the middle or they, they feel like you're telling the truth. Um, and the one that came up in the middle for me was, have you ever stolen anything? And I told them about this bouncy ball I stole when I was like a little kid. Right? <laughs> so they're like, okay, aside from what you told us, have you ever stolen, stolen anything? I said, no. But when I was, ans when they asked that question, I was thinking about like when I was a teenager into college, but mostly like in high school when, when like, uh, what was it called? Napster. And those, uh, those music programs came out where you could like jack people's music yes. and, and, and over the internet. And I did that. I had a ton of music because of that. Mm -hmm. So that's not what they're looking for. Like, right. But technically it's theft. Uh -huh. I didn't pay for it. So <laughs> I, I answered no, but like, as I answered that, that was in my head and it, it showed up on the polygraph. And yeah. so afterwards they're like, well, what, what was going on here? We know something was going on. What's the deal? So I told them and they were just like, really, are you serious? And I'm like, <laughs> that's what you were concerned about, yeah. but uh, extremely uncomfortable experience. Um, yeah, I had the opposite experience in my polygraph. It only took yeah. me 45 minutes to complete it. I walked in there and she asked me these questions. I had never smoked pot. I had never done drugs. I had never, like, I, had, I was a good kid and I didn't do anything wrong. And so she asked me all these questions. She's like, oh, well, this will be easy because you haven't done anything. I was like, well, yeah. So, and then when I had to lie, like, she's like, okay, these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, you have to tell me that this is a three, even though it's a five. And I'm like, I can't do it. <laughs> it so funny. Uh, that's awesome. Um, there was a comment in here about going to the academy after you're hired versus you can go ahead of time. Um, for us, you can, you can go get your Nebraska certification on your own and pay your own way. If you if you haven't been hired anywhere or whatever, you just want to add that to your uh, your resume. Basically, uh, you can do that in Nebraska. I assume that is similar in other areas, but uh, um, and and it's definitely a good thing to do. It's basically like paying for a short college degree, and it's something that really says, "Hey, I'm serious about this. I went and paid my own way at the academy." We had a couple with us. Is that true for you? You can, can you guys do that at yours? 
I don't know how it is in other states. I know in North Carolina, if you're not hired when you graduate the academy, you have one year to get hired or you have to go through the entire thing again. So if you don't have a, a, a hire date or anything with an agency, then you're out of luck after a year and you just have to go through the whole deal again. I think that's true for us too. And that's, so there's a risk taken there. There's no way that I would want to do that because it's way too much work, you yeah. know, to not get something out of it. I mean, seriously. And there's, there are advantages and disadvantages of being hired. Like I said, I have to put 40 hours a weekend, no matter what, even if we have like 20 hours of class. Mm -hmm. So the other people from Cape Fear that aren't hired, they're just like, Hey, I have a long weekend. See you later. And I'm like, I have to work till five today. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's like this week we're putting in extra hours so we can have a day off of Thanksgiving, like before Thanksgiving. So, yeah, you know, it's just, it's a give and take, but it's, but I'm not going to complain at all because I'm getting paid. So I'm really not. Yeah. About oh it. yeah. It, it's definitely better to go into the Academy <laughs> working yeah. for a police department or yeah, your my, agency. No, I don't have to look for a job is really nice. Exactly. Yep. You're not worried about that. You're just, it's, you've already got it. Just get through the Academy and you're set. Um, but for the guys in my class, at least that didn't have an employer yet. Um, I think they all did by the time they left. So a lot of times they hired right out of graduation. What's that? A lot of times they'll, they'll be hired right after graduation just because the, the agency doesn't have to spend any money on putting them through the Academy. So right. it's a pretty easy hire. Right. And if I remember right, our agency doesn't pay for us. Um, it's actually funded by the state and that each agency that sends officers there has so many slots per academy and it's, it's almost completely funded by the state. So it doesn't cost our department anything or any of the departments. Um, how often does, okay. Marcus is asking how often does he communicate with African Americans and Hispanics. Uh, I've got four, five African American Americans in the class with me. Um, mm. Two of which, three of which, are hired with Wilmington, so I'm pretty close with them. Uh, there's one Hispanic guy that's in the class too, also with Wilmington. Um, other than that, I mean, my personal life, I have friends of all races. I I just I communicate with them just like I do with everybody else. It's no different, right? Okay. Um, so before we started, we kind of talked about how, and this is why this show is called police Academy. I've kind of talked about this before. And if you have jumped in since we started, feel free to ask questions. We're just talking about the Academy process. Kristen is in the Academy right now. That's why he's on the show. So, um, I named this platform police Academy because it's about helping mostly civilians understand how cops think in that not just perspective but um just kind of lending a view into inside of cop brain so let's talk briefly about what it's been like changing from thinking like a civilian to changing like an officer and maybe you know if you can give some examples of that um just touch on that briefly I can give you that story that I told you the other day um, that nobody else has heard. But when I was doing the practical for domestic violence, we had to walk into a scenario where there was a, a man and a woman in a room. She was showing signs that she had been beaten. She had blood on her face and stuff. And he was sitting there with at a table with um, alcohol bottles and like uh, a, a firearm sitting there. So me and my partner, we were doing cover and uh, contact officer techniques where one person goes in and initiates the contact. The other one makes sure that the, the scene is safe. And so, you know, I was the cover officer, but I, I grabbed the firearm off the, off the table, cleared the room of any weapons and stuff like that. And he was doing the interviewing at that time. I was keeping the husband occupied and he was talking to the wife. When he finished talking to the wife, then we swapped places and I started talking to her and he started talking to him. And he realized that it was, you know, time to make the arrest uh, of this gentleman. And so when he went to arrest him, uh, he went to pat him down. And when he did, the guy turned away and looked like he was going to draw a firearm. And I went to, of course, we have plastic guns that aren't functional. They're bright orange, you know, so that they're safe. 
Right. So I went to draw my firearm from my holster and I like almost like panicked, like I froze. And I just sat there because I was, I told you before about my analytical side, I was thinking too much instead of actually reacting. And Mm -hmm. when I went to draw my firearm, I stopped and he has kind of like put him in the handcuff position, but the guy turned around and I saw this like fake Derringer fall to the ground. And I was like, Oh my gosh, if this were real, I would have been dead. Mm -hmm. And it was like, it was like a big, Holy cow moment of, I, you know, this is for real. Like if this were an actual real situation, I can't, I can't stop and freeze. I have to actually react. So that was a really eye opening experience, you know, to understand. And that's, that's just kind of an example of how things have changed for me, changing a mindset of, I have to be very tactically minded. I have to really make sure that I'm, you know, scanning the, the scene instead of just walking in happy go lucky and just whatever happens happens, you, you know, that's going to get you killed if you do that. Right. So, it was, a, it was a really sobering thought. You're right. Um, so that was something that was very weird for me at first. This idea that when you walk into a scene, you have to, if you want to stay alive for very long as a cop. And people talk about, you know, well, you know, there are other professions where people die more often. Well, the reason cops don't die at much higher rates is because they're trained very well in most cases to not die. Right. Like the reason why cops walk into the room and, and control everyone in the room. And when people don't obey those directives from the officers, things get things, bad things happen, right? People get arrested for obstructing because they're not listening to the officer or whatever. But the reason why the officers are giving those commands to, you know, sit there, cross your legs, don't move, whatever, is because that's how they stay alive. They don't know the people. They don't know what's in the room or in that area. And um, that was a huge change for me going from normal civilian to now you're going to just be thrown in these situations in the real world where you don't have time to make a mistake or second guess yourself. You have to make the right decision or you or someone else might die. And um, the realization that you had to control the environment around you, um, that was, that was probably one of the, one of the biggest changes for me, at least it's good that you brought that up. Um, How has your perspective changed in, in, any other ways that you can think of just perspective? Like that's a good example, but have you noticed, like, have you noticed uh, if you're out in the public with your, with your wife or kids and this is something you might notice more after you get out on the road, but um, any other ways that you notice that those, the way that you process the world around you is changing? Um, I guess it's kind of trivial, but like, I all the time see people breaking the law on the road. <laughs> like I'm <laughs> yeah. driving and I'm like, they didn't signal, they turned off on red, you know, and I'm like, my wife is like, shut up. So <laughs> I don't say anything about it. Like I just kind of keep it to myself, but I mean, stupid stuff like that. But otherwise I don't know if I've really had enough experience out there yet. I think that's really going to come in field training because I think about, I go into places and look at people and I say, I wonder if I would arrest somebody like that. I wonder if that person's done anything you know, to be arrested for. And I just, I kind of scan, but at this point, you know, I'm not afraid to go anywhere because nobody knows that I'm a cop and nobody knows that I've arrested anybody yet. I think it'll change whenever I get to that point where I see somebody in public and say, Oh crap, I arrested that person for drugs. You know, and they might recognize me and I have my wife here and I want to be, make sure we're protected. You know, like what if they get pissed off? You know, like I don't know how that, how I'm going to react to that. I just, I haven't dealt with it yet. I've had friends who have been officers for years who have told me that they can't go to certain places now. They won't go to certain restaurants because they know who the cooks are and they know, you know, they won't, they won't eat there. And I'm just, I, I don't want to be that guy, but I don't know if I will be that guy. So I can't say that yet. Um, I can confidently say you will be that guy. <laughs> you will. Um, I was just talking to a good friend of mine this weekend about how, when you fill out your, we call them field interview cards, um, you make contact with somebody in the field 
and you're going to identify them. We would write all, all, their name, date of birth, address, phone number, and place of work on this card. And I mean, you, you knew where most of the people that you dealt with all the time worked. Lots of Wendy's, Arby's, McDonald's, uh, Taco Bell, Burger King, that kind of stuff. The real like cheap fast food. Um, so there were very few sacred restaurants uh, aside from the ones that made food in front of you, like Subway, Chipotle, that kind of stuff. Very few. Um, Chick-fil-A was one for a while where I hadn't arrested anyone or <laughs> dealt with anyone that was hateful, let's say, toward the police. Um, that was Chick-fil-A and Village Inn. We like we would eat at Village Inn um, every other Sunday morning when I was on shift that day, and both of those fell off the wagon at some point in my career where I had you know I arrested somebody that worked there, and I'd be driving to jail and where do you work? Chick Fil A. Dang it, <laughs> not eating lunch there anymore. So I, I, you have to at some at times, but you def it definitely gets to you. It's like what's in this food, you know? Right. If you can't see it made. Can you trust it? Yeah. I don't know. So do you live in the community that you're going to serve in? I do. I, I live right outside the city limits, but I mean, it's close enough to where it might as well be. And of course our jurisdiction goes one mile outside as the crow flies. So okay. technically I'm sort of still inside the limit, in the limit of the city. So, so, I'm, I'm pretty so you're, you're going to be shopping and eating off duty in the same place that you work. Yes, and my wife works in the city, so if I ever meet her for lunch or anything, we'll be in the city. Right. The, now, it depends on what district I work, because it's divided up into six districts, but I'm still, I'm going to be working all of them at some point. Yeah. Um, and it, it's different for everybody. There are guys that have lived in, that live in their communities that they serve in and have no problem with it. Um, for me my family comes first regardless, I can still be a good officer and serve my community and connect with that community, but not live in it. Yeah. Um, you have to be intentional about it. I, I, I know there's, there's an argument for living in your community that you serve in, um, just because it, it makes it more personal. It is your community, you know, on and off duty. Um, and that is how it was for me for the first two to three years. And we moved and it, it wasn't just, it wasn't because only because of these issues, it, it had to do with where our kids were going to go to school and that kind of stuff. But uh, it was, um, I did not like living in the community that I served in be, for the same reasons we talked about at the beginning where you drive down the street and you can't go a block without going, you know, this happened there. I arrested that guy there and you can't go to Walmart or target or the rest, you know, Chick-fil-A, Chipotle, whatever off duty and not see someone that you've arrested. Right. And for me being with my family when I'm off duty, I want to be able to relax a little bit at some point in my life. And yeah. it's hard to do when you're surrounded by people that may really, really not like you. So that, that was a struggle for me, but some people do no, it just no. fine. To a certain extent, as a teacher, I dealt with that. It wasn't in the same capacity, but, you know, like my wife and I were both teachers in Tennessee and she worked in Georgia and I worked in Tennessee. Well, we lived in the town that I taught in. So I saw people all the time at the stores and everything in restaurants and whatever. But it's different as a teacher because you're not out there arresting people and questioning people and all that. So, I mean, I, right. I dealt with people in the public and it's, it is annoying on one hand to walk into a, a store and you can't go anywhere because everybody wants to talk to you. Mm -hmm. I guess it's the opposite as a cop. Nobody wants <laughs> it's to talk the opposite, to you. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm okay with that. <laughs> um, and then now you're just going to have both. You're going to have all the old people that used to know you wanting to talk to you. Yeah. And then everyone else giving you the, the stank. Eye. Well, I, I used to live in Tennessee, so I'm not, I'm not there anymore. So I don't have to worry about those people. I just have to. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. You're right. Okay. I forgot. Um, what have you covered so far in the Academy? Um, let me get my schedule out here <laughs> and I'll tell you right now we're going over uh, motor vehicle law. That's our next topic of conversation. We're actually finishing up firearms tomorrow. 
Um, we've done controlled substances. We've done crime prevention techniques where we've done like crime scene investigation and things like that. Mm-hmm. Domestic violence, um, driver training. That was a lot of fun. Driving cars yeah. were the best. That was um, my favorite. Fingerprinting, photographing, uh, responding to victims, subject control and arrest techniques. Now that was a lot of fun too. Taking people down to the mats and handcuffing and all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, juvenile law elements of let's see, elements of criminal law, um, arrest, search, and seizure, ABC laws, and communication, radio procedures. That's all the stuff that we've done so far. Um, and we are in week 12 now. And how long is the academy total again? Uh, let's see. I think it's about it's total of about eighteen weeks, but there's it's weird because we have a holiday break too. So there's two weeks where we don't do anything at Cape Fear, hmm. but we actually have some Wilmington duties to do. Because um, even though those two weeks, those two weeks at Christmas time, we have no school, but we have to be at the station for forty hours. So. We're doing, I think we're going to do like a Christmas party and stuff like that, but we're also going to try to get our OC spray certifications, our baton, taser, all that kind of stuff done during that time so we can finish post faster and get on the street. I don't know. I'm weird. I'm actually looking forward to getting tased and pepper sprayed. I think it's going to be fun. You're looking forward to it? Absolutely. And I'm the president of our WPD group, so they told me that I have to take the full five-second ride with the probes, and I was like, okay. Yeah. The OC I, spray, uh, it's probably going to suck, but it's all right. I'll deal. I wasn't president of anything at the time, but they gave us the option of getting actually shot with the probes or just the little alligator clips. Right. Um, and taking the full ride or just like a two or three second deal. And the taser instructor who I, as I got to know, you know, his personality later on was full of crap and just wanted to see somebody take the ride and was like, Oh, you know, it, it doesn't feel like five seconds. It feels like a second and a half, you know, whatever. I'm like, ah, you know, if I'm going to do this to anyone, I want to know what it's really like. So shoot me in the back. Mm-hmm. And, uh, I regret that mistake to this day. It was well, not, it was not an enjoyable experience. They said to me, usually the president is the one that's volunteered to take the full ride. And I said, that's okay. I was going to volunteer to do it anyway. So. I I would rather do pepper spray again. I know I am an outlier there, but yeah, the taser did... from everybody, but I haven't had either. So I'll, I'll see. Yeah. The taser was not any fun. Um, but to your point, it's, it's correct. I want to know what people go through whenever I do this to them. So I want to, I want to do it. Yeah, I, 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 I just feel like that's fair. You know, it's like yeah. I have to be able. I felt like I had to be able to say, yes, I have done the entire five second ride. I know how terrible it is. Mm-hmm. I would never want to um, put someone through that unless it was the best thing possible for that moment. Um, it's terrible. <laughs> but it's yeah. it's a really effective tool too. So, and you weren't under the influence of drugs, and so you actually felt all of it. Yeah, exactly. I was I was sober. I yeah. wish they would have let me drink a little before. I did uh, no. that. They're not in the right mind to deal it anyway. Um, Pat's asking, how are they training with the taser up here? They aren't using as first response. Um, I'm not sure what he's getting at exactly um is he possibly talking about the order of weapons that you use yeah like first first taser then oc spray then yeah whatever. he might be talking about like use of force levels which um kind of i mean i'm sure you can speak to that but it's it's kind of subjective it depends on the situation yeah for sure um there's some some indications that tasers aren't as safe as we think they are um, some people have died and depending on who you listen to, it, it's caused by, um, excited delirium, but there's some, there's some debate about whether that's actually a thing or if that's just what the industry is made up as an excuse for 
basically a taser killing somebody. Right. Um, but they, relative to the other options, which is basically uh, a lot of times pepper spray isn't isn't effective in a situation where taser would be. But relative to actually physically going on hands on and tackling and and fighting with somebody, a taser is really safe in most situations and prevents a lot of injuries. Um, so for us, tasers, when I first started, were basically if you can go hands on and um, and, and basically physically control someone and they're not obeying commands, you can go to a taser. You don't even have to go hands-on first. It's, hey, if you're not going to do what I'm telling you to do and I feel like if I try to go hands-on, you're gonna there's something going on here and I don't feel comfortable or I feel like you're going to get hurt or I'm going to get hurt, you could just tase them. Obviously, you tell them, you know, hey, I'm going to tase you if you don't do what I tell you to do, and usually that solved it. But uh, by the time I left, they changed their use of force continuum to basically whatever's reasonable. But under that standard, it's the same. It's like, listen, if if this guy's pretty big, I'm by myself. Um, I'm not going to go hands-on and, and possibly end up shooting him because he overpowers me. I'm just going to tase him right here. Right. Um, so A lot of times when you put that red dot on their chest, they change their mind. Oh, yeah. Most, most of the time they do. Because they're like, oh, this is real. Yeah, I don't want that. And then some paces, you know, have a, a policy where you can't OC and then tase because of the fire or whatever, you know, so. Uh, Pat said he, they made, they made them, I'm not sure where he's at. He said, he keeps saying up. So he's up north somewhere. They made them go through the entire thing with the probes. And he said he'd rather have pepper too. So I'm not <laughs> alone. Pat likes pepper better than taser. I will surely let you know how that goes for me. <laughs> um, and, and the question he the comment he said earlier, he was getting at that they're backing off of using tasers up there where he's at. Uh, I'm assuming for the reasons that I mentioned. So we're kind of finding out that they may not be as safe as we thought they were. So I have a video that I did from Independence, Missouri, where a kid basically went into cardiac arrest after that. being tased for like 20, yeah, 23, 23 seconds, Bryce Masters. And I mean, it, it sounds like I haven't done real in-depth research on it, but from what I've heard and read so far, it does sound like the taser caused it. So definitely yeah. some concerns there. But um, what's been the most – you said driving was the most fun. Do you have any funny stories from that? I had, I oh, had absolutely. Blast, I had a blast with Evoc. It was awesome. I, I have a real good one. Um, we did this thing called the offset lane maneuver where you have an entry set of cones and then you have to make a very quick decision on whether to go left, go right, or go straight and stop mm -hmm. before another set of cones. And the instructor, when he told us in class, I don't know if you can see my hands here, he said, you take your arms and you cross them over like this, touch your forearms together and go back. And if you're going left, if you're going right, you do the opposite. It's just a very quick, he says right, you do that, and then you go back. Yeah. So, he, and he made a huge deal about make sure you hold it nine and three, nine and three, nine and three. I was like, okay. So I get in the Crown Vic, all right? I, we're going 35 miles an hour. I hit the first set of cones, and he says, left. I did that, and I knocked over every single cone. <laughs> it was just thump, 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 thump. And he goes, all right. And then there's like 50 <laughs> people on the outside going to set the cones back up, you know? And this is, mind you, I have to back up a little bit because the guys that were in the car with me, there was three of us and an instructor. The other two guys went first and they did everything perfectly. And so I'm like, that looks easy. I got this. And then I knock all over the cones. So we go back to the course again. And he, 35 miles an hour, I, I go through the entry cones. He says, right, boom, same thing. Thump, 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 thump. Knock down all the cones. And I'm like, uh, what am I doing wrong? So he tells me, the instructor, he's sitting next to me. He goes, take your hands instead of nine and three, put them at 10 and two, and don't go all the way. He said, make it quick, but don't go all the way and touch your arms. I did it perfectly from there on out. Yeah. And I was like, the guy in the classroom told me the opposite. So, you know, you can't always learn what you do in the classroom and apply it exactly. Yeah. But it was, it was really funny because I took out most cones that day. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, but I ended up doing pretty well on the rest of the course. Uh, 
my favorite part was like for the first time turning the blue lights and siren on at night and chasing somebody. That was awesome. Yeah, that is a fun first experience. A whole lot of fun. <laughs> um, I'm trying to remember. We did, we did eight and four, I believe. So, it's, it, ten and two is like kind of going out when when I came in the academy because. When your hands are up here, you're more likely to break something when the airbag goes off, uh -huh. apparently. So they were having us having having us put our hands down here, basically, uh -huh. which felt weird at first, but I I actually like it because um, you have a lot of strength here because of the position your arms are in. You can kind of brace your elbows against your body, um, and you're using a lot of like biceps, whereas up here your arms are extended further. So I've actually ever since the Academy used that driving position for like, if I take my personal car out to the track or just anything that's kind of like high spirited driving, call it that. Uh, mm -hmm. And it works really well. <laughs> it works really well for me. Okay. So yeah. Not and thing, backing uh, up is really fun. Yeah. Um, and I, I actually ended up being one of the best parallel parkers um, because I've had so much driving experience. I'm 36. So the 20 and 22 year olds were like hitting cones everywhere. And I was like zipping in and out of the parallel parking spots and stuff. And they're like, how'd you do that? I said, I'm old. <laughs> I'm I old. Do. I've done this a lot. Yes. There was one trick that I used that helped tremendously with, and I still use it. Um, I, I used it before the Academy. So I just applied it there for backing, which is just running your mirrors down your yeah. side mirrors even in the middle of the course, a timed course, the second I'm coming up to that backing up spot, I'm running my mirrors down, throw it in reverse, so I can actually see my rear tire, and it's easy. As long as you can see where you're going with your mirror, it's really easy. We weren't allowed to use side mirrors at all. We weren't. Oh, to use <laughs> they don't let you use side mirrors? We just had to use windshield and back windshield, and that was it. Huh. So that's an interesting it, it, it's philosophy. Not for real. Yeah, that's. Are you guys using Crown Vicks? I assume at the academy. Uh, at the academy, we had one charger, and the rest were Crown Vicks. It was an older charger, and it kept overheating <laughs> <laughs> because we were stomping the crap out of it. But then the one of the Crown Vicks lost the transmission, yeah. so like you just hit the gas, and it would just rev. And that was right in the middle of my pursuit chase. And so I come out of a fixed radius curve and I hit the gas and I hear, and it didn't go anywhere. And I was like, how am I supposed to catch a criminal if the car doesn't work? I was really ticked off. Uh, yeah, that's. The instructor looks at me. He goes, it's not the car. It's the driver. I said, bull crap. It's not. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Pat saying 10 and four in Connecticut as well. And racing trains the same. Yes, that's true. Uh, I get. I bet you you could find some places that would train lower as well. But I I think you're right, Pat. I, as far as racing goes, too, I've seen more guys with their hands up high on the wheel. Um, I think it's a, oh. W one other trick that I used in the driving stuff, evoc we call it, um, pursuit training, whatever, ver emergency vehicles operations, uh, was. I threw those crown Vicks all the way down into one. And especially for the inside course or like a more like an autocross, a cone course, not high speed stuff. I just put it in one because that forces the car to stay in the lowest gear possible. Uh -huh. So it doesn't, sorry, I got you on the camera just looking at me. Um, the car will downshift when it needs to. So you're coming out of a curve or, or whatever you're doing, it's always got the RPMs up and that made a huge difference. Uh, the, cause those crown Vicks will upshift really fast. So if you're really trying to push it, you spend half your time shifting back into a low gear every time you come back out of a corner or get back on the gas. If you put it down into one, granted you might blow the transmission or the engine, but <laughs> But you'll get a better life. you'll get a better lap time, and I hold a record at my academy, so yeah. it was worth it. It was worth actually, it. Actually, the Crown Vicks were not bad to drive. I actually enjoyed them, but no. the, the Chargers are fun. They just sound mean. Yeah, no, the Charger, the Charger is fun if you have room to run. But if you're talking like cone courses and um, 
I call it slow speed stuff, but stuff where it's it's stop and go fast. Yeah. The Crown Vic is way more fun because you can ABS, it has a lot of body roll. Yeah. Go ahead. Well, the ABS on the charger is terrible. It increases stopping <laughs> distance so much. Yeah. And their transmissions are terrible. Yeah. So. The chargers are, yes, Pat, the chargers are hard to see out of. That's the other problem yes. they have. Lots of blind spots. Um, what's been the most challenging thing that you've gone through? Um, just doing a different career because I was a teacher for 11 years. And so just making a transition to this is something new and I'm 36 years old. So that's just been the hardest thing. But it's exciting at the same time because it's different. Being a teacher and just your general life experience though you're 36 you say you're the oldest one in your academy how do you feel like that has prepared you for what you're doing now there's a lot of um, instructors that are my age or younger that i talk to and like we share a life experience so that helps the person that recruited me from wpd is exactly my age and he's been an officer for 10 years Mm-hmm. So, uh, we have gotten a good relationship because we, you know, we can relate to each other. Um, I'm a lot more mature, I would think than the younger kids in the class. And so I like a lot of them are kind of, you know, antsy about doing things and have their cell phones out and doing whatever. And I'm just like intensely focused, you know, because I know this is for real for me. So it's not an option not to pass this and not to do well. So that's, right. I think that's a difference for me. Um, just kind of wrapping up what back to that question that you asked me, what should I expect? What would you say to someone that wants to get into law enforcement? Cause I know I have uh, a few people that, that listen to the podcast, watch this show who want to be cops or are, are, are soon to be as you were when you emailed me. So give say two words of wisdom. If you have more, that's fine. But, Two yeah. of the most important things that you feel like are important for them to think about or prepare for going into an academy experience. Well, in terms of, I guess, something a little bit different, but so or along the same lines, even at the academy, but mostly if you're getting hired by a, an agency, be professional. Show up in a shirt and tie, and you know, in a suit or a dress. If you're a girl, you know, like make sure you look presentable. Make sure that you are manners all the time yes sir no sir yes ma'am no ma'am it goes a really long way because you know you're making impressions all the time when you're at the academy you're you're interviewing every day all the instructors that you have for the first time are looking at you as if it's their first time and saying this person's good or not good and so you have to always make those good impressions you always have to be on your a game even if you're sitting there just learning for four hours and listening to a lecture Mm -hmm. always be professional and always remain in control of what you're doing because you never know what's if it's going to be taken from you. Uh, I'm a probationary hire. I'm a trainee. And they say, this is a conditional job offer. I have no guarantee of a job until I graduate and they swear me in. So mm-hmm. I'm always, you know, on, on guard to make sure I'm doing everything the right way. Right. So just be professional, stay on top of your academics. It's not that hard. If you study, if you work hard, I don't study more than, 30 minutes for each test, but you know, just paying attention. That, that's the big thing. Just being a, a normal person, paying attention and really staying on top of things. Right. Big. Was that, was that one thing or is that two? Uh, Last track. We can make it two, but I mean, that was a long one. So yeah. Um, but I, I second that I, and kind of what that boils down to is treat it like, you treat it like you're in the military. Yes. Even if your academy is not militaristic, you are in law enforcement or you're, you're coming into a culture that is still um, typically structured like a military hierarchy. And a lot of people that matter as far as getting hired, um, who you're going to work for, who's going to promote you, who's going to pass you on the test, have a more militaristic experience or ideology, they are going to expect that you're at a minimum 10 minutes early because if you're 10 minutes early, you're on time. 
They're going to expect your stuff to look clean and pressed and shiny and whatever. Um, you just, you, yeah, you're right. You can't slack. You have to stay on top of stuff. It's not like, it's not rocket science. Any average intelligence person can pass the academy as long as they try. You pay attention, you try, and, and don't be a goofball. You can have fun, but you have to be a professional right. because you're going to go out and do a job that's really important and you're always going to be on camera. If you can't be professional now, then how can they trust you in that uniform? And so. the other thing is you remember you're a public servant. You're doing this because you're in service. You want to serve people. Right. It's not about you. It's about everybody else and making a difference in your community. And that's such a cliche answer, but it's the truth. I wouldn't do this if I thought, oh, I'm going to you know, look good in uniform and I get to shoot a gun and stuff like that. Yeah, those are perks and that's cool, but it's not what it's about. It's about serving other people and making your community a better place to live. Yeah, exactly. That insight, you know? Right. Um, I don't think I mentioned this before and I'll close with this, but Kristen is actually doing um, about weekly video logs of his experience at the Academy. And when those are all done and he, he's all the way through, uh, at some point I'll have those all put together and, and I'll put them on the channel for you guys to see. So um, he's been doing that for me, which is awesome. I haven't, in all honesty, gotten through all of them yet. Um, but so no promises on what's going to be in there. Maybe a surprise box, but uh, you get to see more of Kristen later when we get through all those. But thank you for doing those. That's I think it's gonna, I think it's going to be pretty cool to to be able to see that progression. I appreciate the opportunity. Um, any last words? Um, if you're thinking about getting into law enforcement, make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, and make sure that you know exactly what you're getting into, and Make sure if you get into it and you realize it's not for you that you get out of it. I've had a couple of people drop out of class in the last week after failing certain things and not qualifying and doing whatever, just and just realizing, hey, this is not for me. I need to get out of it. So knowing that time to get out is important too. Right. And rare. Yeah. I think, yeah, that's my experience as well. A lot of people that uh, thought it was one thing and it's not. And, uh, you know, sometimes it's, I know that not speaking to you, but speaking to anyone watching or listening, it is a career. And that's what civilians don't understand that cops, they're paying their bills. So it, it's a job too. In in a lot of ways, it, it is just a job for some people, but it's more than a job. And if it has become just a job and it's not something where you can honestly go and say that you're there to serve, you're there to help people, you're there to make your community a better place, then it's probably time to start looking for another career. And that probably does not sit well with a lot. If, if there were a thousand cops listening, I'd have about 500 <laughs> emails, people saying, you can't say that. Well, no, I can, and you probably need to find a new career. If yeah. that if that pisses you off and you're in law enforcement, go do something else because that's your job, whether you like it or not. Yeah. All right, man. Well, thanks for doing this. Um, took, what is it, an well, hour, hour yeah. and 20 minutes out of your night. appreciate it. All good. I um, hope everybody enjoyed it. Uh, got a couple comments. All right, yep. We'll end with that. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, sir. We'll see you Thank next you. time. All right. Bye. See you.